And that leaves me. My name is Kelly Corrigan. Even just going to the mall is like not something I sign up for that often because I'm dreadfully cheap. To the point where my husband once said, like, I don't feel like I'm going to be able to have sex with you anymore if you keep wearing clothes from Costco. <laughs> I yelled at the girls and he saw me and he said, you know, when I first met you, you didn't drink coffee and you were so mellow. And I was like, oh, honey. I was a dog in show. I was high stepping with my sparkly collar and my shiny hair. And 12 years and two puppies later, I'm an ungroomed bitch. <laughs> There's a lot of heartbreak in parenthood. Basically, like, if you do it right, you're just forever saying goodbye. First you take them to preschool, and then they go to school all day long, and then you drop them off at camp, and then you take them to college, and then they float off into their own lives, and it's just... You're just watching them like turn over into their next self over and over and over until they're gone. To every child everywhere who is leaving home soon, don't pose like this on Instagram. The stamp goes in the upper right hand corner of the envelope. Really the juiciest thing for me is like, tell me about your family. You know, who's your mother? What, what's the worst fight you ever had with your kid? What do you and your husband do about finances? Like, I just want to know everything about how a family works together or doesn't work together. And those are the stories I'm always the most grateful when people share. So I did become interesting, but only in the way that we are all interesting. Hi, welcome to Inquirer Live. I'm Ellen Gray. I'm an Inquirer staff writer. Kelly Corrigan is the author of four best-selling books, all of which in some ways have their roots in the house in Villanova where she grew up. She has a children's book coming out in the next year and is at work on at least two more books, including a novel. You can also read her essays on Medium and elsewhere. When she's not writing, she may be helping to coach J.B. LaCrosse, cuddling babies in a neonatal unit, delivering commencement addresses like the one she did for her alma mater, Radnor High, in June, or parenting two teenage girls. Not necessarily in that order. Oh, and she paints. This month, she added TV interview show, PBS's Tell Me More with Kelly Corrigan, and a weekly podcast, Kelly Corrigan Wonders, where she and guests wrestle with big questions, including why we say everything happens for a reason. I'm so happy to welcome Kelly Corrigan to Inquire Alive. Hey. Hi. How are you? Good. You Philly? Yes, you're a long way away. I don't I know, know it's it. I really do. I almost came. I, I bought a ticket to Philadelphia to see my mom, who still lives in the house I grew up in in Villanova. And I was going to surprise her on her birthday. And then I thought, oh, God, if I, if I do that, then probably both my brothers will come over and they have kids. And maybe they'll come over and... The next thing you know, there'll be like all these germs in one place and a little 81 year old woman mm -hmm. uh, who is a at a level of danger that I'm not. And so I pulled I pulled out at the last second, but I really miss Philly. I love coming home. Well, I hope you can be here for her at a second. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you um, wrote something recently. I think it was on Medium about all the twists and turns that happened mm. while you were getting to this TV show, which you kind of said took 16 years. Yeah. And, and in the time, during that time, you became so convinced that you weren't going to get there that you started a podcast. Yeah. Now, do you feel like you're one of those parents who adopted and then immediately conceived? I mean, you have twice yeah. the blessings, twice the diapers. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I really thought, that with the PBS show, well, let me go back. 16 years ago, I was on the Today Show with my dad. And it, we had both had cancer and we were both recovering. And it was the first day of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And Katie Couric interviewed us. And it just couldn't have been more fun. And then I left that day and I said to my dad, like, that's the job. Like, I want Terry Gross's job. I want Charlie Rose's job. Like, that's the job that I like. And then over the years, I had done more stuff with the Today Show. I've been on maybe seven times, and I talked to lots of producers about different ideas. And then I had met with people at The View. And then I did this screen test with Deion Sanders for a new talk show on ABC. 
and was quickly shown the door. And, you know, it was just the kind of this thread that had been running through my regularly scheduled life. And it seemed very absurd most of the time. But then PBS came and I thought, oh, maybe this will be the one. Maybe this is where it will land. And what a wonderful place to land because you can talk to someone for a whole hour and there's no commercial interruptions and there's no pressure to do things that I don't want to do, which is like dig into your divorce or talk about, um, I don't know, what bathing suits flatter, which figures, you know. Uh, so that and that conversation started 18 months ago. And they, at first they were going to give us one show and then they had it scheduled for July and then COVID hit. And then we got three yeses all around the same time, Brian Stevenson, James Corden and Jennifer Garner. So then we went back to PBS and said, we have three, like, can you let us do three, please, please. And so anyway, there was tons of back and forth, as you might imagine, and voila, we are here. So Brian Stevenson, the great civil rights attorney from Alabama and Just Mercy for everyone who read that or saw that movie. That was, that's aired. And then last night, is it today, Tuesday? No, uh, Monday night, uh, the interview with James Corden aired, which was so fun. The most fun I could ever yeah. have. And then next Monday is Jen Garner, who's a friend of mine. And it's, she's so wonderful. And there's so much more to her than anybody knows. So I can't wait for it to air. I One thing, you go so deep with both. Well, I wasn't surprised that you went deep with Brian Stevenson because he's a deep guy. I'm not yeah, sure that sure. people were expecting James Corden to be so deep. I know. How did you, when you pitched these people, and I know you pitched more than three people. Yes. What did you tell them about what, did they know they were what they were getting into? It was so funny because uh, a little part of the show is this thing called Plus Two, which was this idea of mine, honestly, that I really love like a rehearsal dinner toast or like a 50th birthday party toast. Like I just love hearing people gush about the people they love. And so I was trying to factor, like create moments like that within the show where say James Corden could talk about two people in his life that he wished like, the whole world knows more, knew more about. And so for instance, he picked his son's drama teacher and then this TikToker, mm -hmm. this kid on TikTok that he was really impressed with. And, um, and I thought, I want to create the space for this, but it was confusing people. So when we finally got together with James, like not only was it not that clear, like where this show was even going to air, like I believe he said C-SPAN in the call and we were like, no, no, it's PBS. Sorry, sorry. And then he said, and you want me to go out and interview these two people? You want me to send a crew to my kid's drama teacher? And it was like, no, 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 we'll do that. We'll do that. Sorry. We, we've we told you too much. The basics are think Charlie Rose in a new format, like same one hour conversation, one on one, um, except that we like to build out the whole B-roll element. So most interview shows, you're just seeing the two people. But ours is it's there's so much background footage that we're collecting on each person that it's almost like a hybrid of a documentary and an interview. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, a TV show is very cool, but a podcast is something that people literally carry around with them. I know. And you've done them before. What is it about the medium and that you like? And what's special particularly about Kelly Corrigan Wonders? So the, the, the medium is so interesting, I think, because the relationship is so deep. Like the the interview show, I think will live and die on our guests. Like I don't actually think it has that much to do with me. I think it's beautiful editing that this team is doing from Second Peninsula. And then I think we got three killer guests. And then I just have to not screw anything up. The podcast really is way more me. It's way more a conversation between two people that's kind of equally weighted between the two of us. And the reviews on this thing, I mean, it just came out, the, the we've just released two. Mm -hmm. um, and the reviews are so intimate. It's like, like tons of people are crying, which I, which I guess I kind of expected. I mean, I got choked up in both of them, but I'm sort of on a hair trigger. Like I cry at commercials. I cry like when I think about Claire going to college, you know, like Claire recent, my daughter recently asked me like, how many times do you think you're going to cry before I go to college? She's a senior. And I was like, I'm going to say 18. She's like, that's what I thought. That's about what I guessed. <laughs> But even the, the people who are listening to the podcast are feeling super moved. And in a weird way, like if you look at the reviews, there have already been like 200 five-star reviews on wow. Apple Podcasts. 
And if you read them, it's people are feeling heard in a way, like they feel like what we're talking about has a lot to do with them. So it's never like a, a, a kind of podcast that's very popular is like having a movie star on and, and kind of going through their career highlights. That is not at all what this is. This is yeah. like talking about, for instance, the one we released yesterday with Nadia Boltz Weber was about when to give up and when to hold tight. And why are we so ashamed to give up on things? And what's the difference between giving up and letting go? And we talked about people stopping cancer treatments and, and what that feels like to say to your spouse, I can't do it anymore. It's not going to work. And I want to let go. And then we talked about uh, much simpler things that people give up in their daily lives and maybe should like being judged or um, wearing heels in my case, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and, and letting go of relationships that are painful mm -hmm. or toxic or fruitless, like that are just like on this permanent repeat that you cannot break the cycle. So anyway, the responses to it have been a, like gratitude, like the the primary reaction is thank you, thank you for saying that. That's exactly how I feel, and you kind of set me free. Well, I think also the first one about uh, what, why, when we say what everything happens for a reason, mm -hmm. and particularly this year, that's mm -hmm. a tough one for a lot of people. Yeah. So the whole the first four that are coming out in October are basically answers to the question, what conventional wisdom turns out to be not that wise after all, and potentially a little damaging. So we talk about the wisdom of like, trust your gut with this woman, Annie Jean-Baptiste, she's the head of product inclusion at Google. And she's like, trusting your gut's like a little dicey because your gut is formed by your life experiences, which are formed by how much money you have and what color your skin is. So your gut isn't really like um, a well-oiled machine. It's actually very particular to you, which means it's limited. A everyone's is. And so it was, that was just like a fascinating conversation. And then um, we talked about everything happens for a reason with this great woman, Kate Bowler, who's a Duke professor, a writer, a podcaster, and she's a stage four colon cancer patient and the mother of a six-year-old. And she said, you know, there's this idea that people want to say something loving and kind. And many, many people say things happen for, just remember, things happen for a reason. And she just can't stand it. She can't brook it. So she was talking about why that is, like why, it, very empathetically, actually, saying that, of course, we want there to be reason. Like, it's quite a sophisticated position to to rest in that there's a lot of randomness and uh life is horrifyingly unfair at times like that's well, just I, tough, I thought she was very it. generous considering her very situation. generous exactly but, exactly well you've between that podcast and your books where you've discussed your own bout with cancer and the losses of your father and a close friend. Have you come up with it? I mean, right now, particularly, we're all having to give condolences a lot. Mm. We're all having to empathize with people a lot. Often, you don't know what to say. Mm. Can you think of something that somebody said to you at a time like that that actually helped? Mm. I mean, that's sort of the thesis of Tell Me More, both the book yeah. and the show which is um, really the gift of all gifts is to be understood, to be known, to be heard. And I, so I actually don't think it would be the thing someone said to me, it would be more like the question someone asked me. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting now, like, you know, grief is such a weird thing and everyone's carrying it for someone, if not more than one person. and even to be asked now, which is well past the sort of active period of grieving for my dad and for my friend Liz lots. It's such a lovely gift for someone to say, how are you feeling? You know, like, when do you miss your dad? Or when do you miss Liz? And so that the, 
I mean, my only advice in that department would be to say, tell me more, what else go on and let people just like unpack their emotional garage, you know, just like clear it out, get all the way to the back wall. So when was the first, I mean, you, ha you have a lot of identities now, but when was the first time you thought of yourself as a writer? Hmm. Well, I've been writing since seventh grade. Like I've been writing in journals my whole life. I still do longhand. And I also was uh, one of the world's great letter writers. Like I wrote 15 page letters home from Camp Taqua on the Chesapeake Bay to my parents in the summer. And I really reveled in the detail. Like I was into telling them about the bug juice and then like um, the Sioux Ute dance and then the game of tetherball that I won and the game of tetherball that I lost and this cute boy I liked and how he wore jams, bathing suits and on and on and on and on. And so, and I have some of those because they went to my parents and so my mom kept them. And um, when I look at them, I think like, oh, you love the ordinary. You've always loved like the ordinary details that make up a day. And I think it's almost like an exercise in gratitude to outline things that way and like slow down long enough to note everything that's happening in a conversation or at the school play or when you're filling out Christmas cards or whatever the case may be. Like there's so much richness inside mm -hmm. ordinary activities. And that's been sort of a fun thing for me to try to find and identify the richness, like locate it, like clear out and find like the one little gem of a moment in there. Um, and that, but I wouldn't have called myself a writer. I would say that I'm, and then I'm first new sense letters. I wanted to write, I always wanted to write a book. That's like the number one thing. If you read my journals going back to middle school, you would see that I wanted to be skinnier and I wanted to write books. Yes. And, um, but, you know, even now, I, I remember saying to my editor, his name's Andy Ward at Random House, who I really love and respect. And he's a lot of great people's editor. Like he's George Saunders editor. He's Lena Dunham's editor. And he's, I said, I'm not really a writer. I'm an author. Like I'm a person who has written a book. And he said, Kelly, how many books do you think you're going to have to write before you think of yourself as a writer? But to be totally honest, I still sort of feel like that. I still sort of feel like someone who wrote some books and not because I know like what I would consider to be real writers. Like I'm friendly with Michael Lewis and I'm friendly with Michael Chabon and all these Bay area people, oh, Annie Lamont, like these people write every day, multiple hours. They would never make a TV show. They wouldn't, although Michael did, Michael Lewis did make a podcast, which is actually pretty great. Now it's almost impossible to be just a writer though. Everybody's branching out. You just and got there social first. media stuff I think is like so weird and demanding and awkward, you know? Cause you don't want, I don't wanna, like Michael Lewis doesn't do social media. I've always noticed that. And nobody's writing better nonfiction than Michael Lewis in my opinion. And what a career. I mean, like many Oscar nominated films have been made out of yeah. his books and spectacular. Um, and he just doesn't do it. But I think I don't even know a woman. I mean, I guess like Marilyn Robinson doesn't do social media, right. but I don't know almost any women writer yeah. who aren't connecting regularly with their readers. And I will say to be totally forthcoming, like when I go to a publicity meeting for Random House for a book release, or to a publicity meeting for PBS or with PRX for the podcast. Every one of those meetings starts with them saying, well, Kelly, you'll have to reach out to your readers and you'll have to tell your followers and you should do ads on your social media feeds. And I think I won't do it unless I really believe that, that the thing we're putting out there has value in and of itself. You know what I mean? Like I won't yeah. just say, hey, listen to this. I'll try to give you something. Like here's a thought. And if you want more thoughts like that, they're over here. But like here, it, even if you don't do anything but absorb this one post, it should be somehow useful cool. to the viewer. More than a link. More than just like, <laughs> yeah. because you could do all social media that only was useful to you. But it should be useful to them. them. You know right. what I mean? I don't want to no, say, I, I, tune in tonight to watch PBS. I want to say, James Corden told me a really interesting thing. He told me that you got to enjoy the doing of it, 
even if it doesn't turn out well on the reception end. If you right. want more, there it is. But that in and of itself is like a worthy thought. I have um, I tend to get very excited when I see women over 50 getting new opportunities, and mm -hmm. which is ridiculous because we have two guys running for president who are in their 70s. Mm -hmm. But does it feel like this is the right time to be tackling new things or do you sometimes wish it had just happened already? Mm, that's funny. That's such an interesting question. I mean, there have been times when I thought, why did you wait so long to try? Why did you wait so long to try to write a book? You knew you wanted to. And you you took yourself out of the game. Like you put yourself on the sideline. And why did you do that? And I want to say that to people who say, like, for instance, I got a master's in English lit, which I think I thought was like, putting me on the road to being a writer, but there's nothing puts you on the road to being a writer except writing. I know. You know, it's like buying a book about running a marathon, like just put your sneakers on and go run a couple miles and then tomorrow run some more. Like people are like yeah. every reading I do, people raise their hand and say, I really want to become a writer. And I say, do you write? And they say, no. And I say, oh, okay, <laughs> it's free. Like the thing you want to be, you could be tonight. It's completely free. There is no barrier to entry. So I wish that I had not put up a barrier for so long. I was 40 when The Middle Place came out. On the flip side, I did a lot of good work for the United Way between college and when I became a writer. And it was really satisfying. And I learned a lot doing that work and seeing that part of the world and trying to marry up like the executives from Citibank or Bank of America or United Airlines. These were all my accounts and the people who worked in the homeless shelters and the food pantries and like trying to stitch those two groups together mm -hmm. was very satisfying to me. So I don't, I don't really regret it. I mean, and the, the whole, the ride of releasing the middle place, which is all about my dad uh, was there's the, I, I mean, I'll never have another experience like that. That was heaven start to finish. We were in the car. My dad and I were in the car with the girls in the back, like a three-year-old and a four-year-old driving down 95 to go see each of his brothers. Cause I wanted the girls to meet my uncles. My dad was one of six kids, mm -hmm. very funny family, very important to all of us. And they, and that's when we started getting the calls. Oh, Simon and Schuster's made an offer for your book. Oh, so-and-so has made an offer for your book. Oh, Random Houses would like to make an offer on your book. And I, I had a flip phone and I would just open it in the car and my agent would read it out loud, read these notes out loud. And my dad and I would just laugh. Like, oh my God, this is really going to happen. Like they're going to put a book in a bookstore with my name on it. And you're the subject. And then when it was on the bestseller list, you know, I'm on the nonfiction side. So if you look at the nonfiction New York Times bestseller list any week, you're going to see there's 15 slots. You're going to see 13 men and two women. And every single one of the men is famous in another way. Either it's like Joe Montana or it's Jack mm -hmm. Welch or it's Obama or it's Bill O'Reilly. So they have a TV show, a radio show. And when that middle place is on the bestseller list for six months and I would call my dad and I'd say, Green, we used to call him Greeny. I'd say, Greeny, you are on the bestseller list with the guy who ran General Motors, the Tony Dungy, who's an NFL coach, I'm told, uh, <laughs> and like Bill O'Reilly and five other guys. And you, you're on the list. Because people, my mom said when the middle place is coming out, she said, well, I think it's very good, Kelly, but who's going to want to read a story about us? Like, we're not rich, we're not poor, we're not you know, troubled. We're not perfect. Like there's nothing interesting about us. And I said, I don't know. I really don't know, mom, but <laughs> the people who are publishing it think it's going to do okay. But that's not our problem. Like whether it works or not, we, we, I did the work, the book is going to the printer and, and we'll see how it goes. And the idea that people would be interested in just a guy who was a great dad, I just found that so encouraging. Well, yeah. it wasn't just about your dad, though. It was also about the fact that you were going through cancer together. Yes. It was really unusual. Yes. It, yes, for sure. Um, your book, Gl Glitter and Glue, mm -hmm. I, you know, I also had a sort of larger than life father. And it wasn't until 
I grew up that I realized how much my mother had influenced me. I had taken her for granted in so many ways. Yeah. And it felt like glitter and glue, you were kind of coming to terms with that too. 100%. Can you talk a little bit about your mother? Sure. Is she watching? I mean, she probably would hate this if I don't think she's watching. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, what's interesting that the title comes from this funny thing that my mom always said, which is your father's the glitter, but I'm the glue. It takes both, Kelly. And that is a thing that is very hard to understand <laughs> before you become a mother yourself. And I always yeah. say that I feel so grateful that my mother is still here, you know, that she didn't die young because I would have understood such, I would have had such an incomplete understanding of her. Not only because all of a sudden I see that what goes on behind the curtain in every mother's life, like the the worry and the weight um, and the replaying and the trying to get your advice just right and is so intense and relentless. You know, I say that my mom, uh, it took me until I was a mother to realize that the reason my mom was so tired all the time wasn't because she was doing so much. It was because she was feeling so much. Mm. And I, I, I think I'll have that for the rest of my life. But the other piece that I wouldn't have understood about her was the way she grandmothers is so different than the yes. way she mothers. Yes. <laughs> She's such a mush. She gets teary. She buys them presents. She wants to hug them all the time. She wants to be alone with them. Like she wants me to drop them and get out so she can have like her own little world with them. Like she's like top, top, top grandmother skills in America. Like she's, she could win the Oscar for best grandmother. And I just wouldn't have known that. I don't know that I would have predicted that because when I was young, I felt like she approached it as like, a job to be done, like a serious work with serious consequences. And it is, it really is. And she created the possibility for my dad to be like, Mr. Good Time Charlie. Mm -hmm. Like you, grand, being a grandmother is the reward for all that work. Because Absolutely. somebody else does the work. And she work. let it, she let us have, and I, I, this happens to me all the time where Georgia, who's my oldest, is very, I mean, both the girls are very close to Edward, my husband. And sometimes I can feel that maybe they even prefer him. And I have both like a little ego hit and a little like, oh, I want to, mm -hmm. I want to be in your club. And also just like a little um, point of connection with my mom. Like, hmm, you did this. You let us do that. You let us be, our relationship be so fun. And you took all the hits. Like she's the, she's the player that, that takes the foul, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I really admire her in so many ways. She also like, you know, like loaves and fishes d it. Like she took whatever he made and made it work for everything. You know, she covered all the bases. She put us all through college. We had no debt coming out of college. Like that's pretty good. Yeah. I guess it is. Yeah. Here. You have this prescription make yourself useful doing something hard with good people which yeah. kind of reminds me of Michael Pollan's eat food not too much mostly plants i mean they they both sound really simple they're kind of complicated to execute yeah how did you arrive at that and was it like a piece at a time or was it all at once i mean one piece that 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 really hit me hard when i heard it and it was probably 15 years ago was that the number one cause of happiness across time and culture and age group is meaningful connection to others. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing I heard is that happiness and productivity are related, which resonates for me. Like if you're in a, if you're in a crap mood, which is why I worry so much about this pandemic, like if you're down, it's really hard to like get up and do your work. Yeah. And so if happiness and productivity and contribution to society um, are all related, and happiness, the driver of happiness is connection to others, then that has to be primary in your game plan. Like the, the connection to others has to be built into how you do whatever it is that you do, because it will lead to happiness and happiness will lead to productivity and productivity will lead to contribution. So it was kind of backing out of that. 
And then the other thing I heard was that this guy, my husband used to work for TiVo in the million years ago. And the guy who started TiVo, this guy, Mike Ramsey said, um, smart people will complicate them, their lives just enough to keep them interesting. And I thought, oh, that's so funny and true, right? Like that it's like we're all doing our own little game of Jenga where it's like, oh, well, that day was kind of like, so I got to like add something in. Like I'm going to, you know, I don't know, I'm going to try to learn to paint. I mean, this is what I've been doing during COVID. It's like, I don't have quite enough pieces in my little Jenga tower. So I'm going to stick another one in there. And I talk to the girls about it all the time that like one of the great challenges of life is getting your days balanced just so. And it'll often feel like you're a little underutilized and then you'll you'll swing too far and you'll be like maxed out. Like it's super hard to get your day just so where you feel mm-hmm. like you got a lot done, but you're not like, Rah! and so that got me to the like doing something hard piece, which is like that Goldilocks idea of like not too hard, not too easy. And also the idea of flow and something being specific to you. Like if you're really good at something and you do it better than other people and that it can only be done by you, whatever this little thing is, that's the, uh, a source of great satisfaction. So that's where the doing something hard thing and then make yourself useful is just from my mom. I mean, that was like what she said our whole childhood. Oh, for God's sake, make yourself useful. So make yourself useful doing something hard with good people is like somehow this incredible mashup of the thing my mom used to say the most, some positive psychology literature and research that says meaningful connection to others is the cause of happiness and that flow is this state where you're working on something that's just hard enough and all that kind of glued together to come up with this mantra, which I had to come pull together for a graduation speech. I think that's where I saw it. <laughs> yeah, which is, it's such a great assignment. Like everyone should have to give a graduation speech because it really does make you think like, God, if, if, if there's anyone in this audience who's even listening, like what should I tell them? Well, I've seen some of your painting on Instagram and <laughs> as somebody who can still do basically stick figures, I was really impressed. Did you really just start painting during the pandemic? I did. I'm so annoyed because all I did was name some sourdough starter. <laughs> it's so fun. I'm a lunatic though. Like I, 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 um, I'm, t- it's taking over the house. Like I'm, I'm pushing my luck with my husband in terms of the mess, but I have these three friends and they paint with me and we paint in the garage and we set up like a two saw horses and this giant old piece of wood so that we can be six feet apart, but at the same giant like makeshift table. And, um, Oh my God, it's so soothing. Cause you can't use your hands. I can't be online. I can't look at anything. True. Yeah. There are so many things that you can. Well, speaking of- And I can't you- eat, Ellen. Cause all I do during COVID is eat, but you can't eat when you have like pain all over your finger. <laughs> I, knit for, I knit for the same reason. Yeah. Um, you are on social media. Yeah. Do you ever engage in doom scroll- scrolling? You know, just- oh, this is so bad. I have to keep yes. reading this. And yes. and do you have any tips for those of us who might like to stop? I mean, you know, it's funny. I wrote a thing for PBS NewsHour early in COVID about um, being very intentional about how much news you were taking in and how much news you had like going on in the atmosphere in houses where there are children. Cause it's a lot, it's a lot for a kid to take in, you know, like 200,000 people dying. It's like a huge number. I mean, remember 9-11, remember how we felt yeah. like, and the, and the relentlessness of it and the unknowability of it. Like, I feel like in terms of parenting Georgia and Claire, it's really critical that we turn a shoulder, turn away from it carefully each day. But then, you know, you want to be part of the solution such that it's possible to be around the everything from the civil rights stuff to um, the election to the pandemic. I mean, you want to know, you want to be an informed person. Everyone at the acquirer wants to be informed. So it is quite challenging. And then, of course, it's kind of delicious, isn't it, to read a bunch of tweets that totally match your value set. 
and have people just going crazy in the, just the same way that you would like to go crazy. But it does leave you with like, you know, a sour stomach. I mean, it's like eating the whole cake. Um, so do I don't take, I, I'm you take breaks from it. Don't say that. Are you able to take breaks from it from time to time? Yes. I mean, the painting helps a lot. I definitely stop at five. You know, like I, I don't, I, and I'll, I also like find myself losing my phone. Like my kids and my husband will say all the time, like, you have no idea where your phone is. And I say, I know, isn't that great? And I loved when I asked uh, James Corden uh, in Tell Me More, what's your guilty pleasure? And he said, uh, going to the bathroom oh and God. pretending like I have really important phone call to make and just sitting there and like staring at a wall and hiding from people who want me to like answer emails. I thought that was incredibly sad. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I, I also can see how many people are in his inbox. No, I'm sure. Um, I think there's a lot of people in everybody's inboxes. Well, you know, it's interesting. The other thing that keeps me uh, in the right zone in terms of the scrolling is that both the podcast and the TV show and doing stuff like this require me to be to monotask. Like when I'm talking to you, I'm only talking to you. When I'm talking to James Corden for three hours, like I, I don't have that many three hour conversations eyeball to eyeball. And with the podcast, like I'm talking to the most interesting, thoughtful, smart, forth, forthcoming people that I can get my hands on. And that's heaven for me. Like talking with people for extended periods of time and doing nothing else while you're doing it, that is like a damn near a lost joy. You talked in the first episode of the podcast about, let me get this right, people being heat seeking missiles for narrative mm. and, and that we make stories of our lives to impose order on chaos. I've always thought of that as something that functional families do. I, I come from what my husband always recur referred to as the only functional family he knew, mm. but, you know, basically a large family that gets along. And I've always thought, you know, are we, some of us just better at a, you know, spinning the chaos or agreeing on a narrative. Mm. Because I think every family has a story. It's just not all of them are happy. Right, right, right. I mean, I definitely came from a functional family too. And we definitely have a set of agreed upon stories. And they're and they're great. And 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 that's a part of any organization is like a set of narratives or the origin story that we all agree on. Like all of that is sort of critical and an unavoidable human behavior like that, that we are drawn to that and there are evolutionary reasons for that. Um, I do think that the pandemic and to a certain extent, the election um, is forcing us once again to face uncertainty and unknowability. And that I think is super hard on us. Like I think our machines, like our uh, the, the brain that we've evolved, um, it does not like that. It wants to sort, it wants to pattern match. It wants to say friend or foe, fight or flight. Like, so this like just waiting, hoping that there's a smooth election that there's some vaccine development, that there's a return to normal that is safe and agreed upon. That's really hard. And so I don't, it doesn't surprise me that we are so drawn to lay a narrative on top of that. That's you know, that has like a beginning and a middle and an end. Well, but I think it's of, not, it doesn't make it true. No, I, I, think, I, really I think sometimes, the, oh, go ahead. Sorry, but I was just going to say the other thing I've really been working on, which Claire, my daughter, was just caught me earlier today, is um, really resisting the desire to ascribe motive to others. So, like, I don't know why a lot of things happen. I don't know why people say yes to sponsoring the podcast, and I don't know why they say no. And to the extent that I want to waste a lot of time guessing and building out a storyline that I can believe in is really kind of a waste of time. 
like, you know, I, as I say to the girls, like, you're, you're never going to know why you did or didn't get into whatever college. You're not going to know why you did or didn't get invited to the party or asked to the prom by so-and-so. Like, most of the time, a thing happens and you don't find out why. And that's really like quite something to adjust to because I'm 53 years old and I'm still like, well, you know why that happened? I'll tell you what happened is for, when I called her, like she, she was just like already up to here. And that's why she just wouldn't even look at the deck. And it's like, what do you know? Like maybe your husband told her he's leaving her that morning. Like you just have no idea what's going on in other people's lives, which goes all the way back to tell me more. Like if you ask more questions, you'll, you'll get way closer to the truth of situations. Well, you were, you know, one of the books you're writing or not writing while you're <laughs> making the podcast. I, by the way, clean bathtubs when I'm trying not to write. Oh, you, yeah. You can, you were much more productive. Um, I clean my well, kitchen what, cabinets. Would a novel I'm cleaning help my you? kitchen cabinets, I know that I'm really procrastinating. Would, would, would writing a novel, first of all, make you feel more like a writer? And two, yes. would it satisfy that need? to answer questions that are unanswerable otherwise? Yes. You're a great interviewer. You should you should have a show on PBS. Yeah, thanks. That's a really good question. That is, that's really interesting. Um, yes, it would probably make me feel more like a writer to instead of telling stories that uh, about my life and my kids, um, to make something up I think is very difficult. Uh, and I've been in, in and out of this novel for many, many years. And it's such a good story and I don't know how to write it. I just had another like lesson from a very smart editor named Barbara. Um, and yes, I mean, the thing about, the thing about nonfiction that people always say is like, oh my God, you're just telling people so much about your life. And I think like, not really. Like I wouldn't tell you about like the worst fight I ever had with my husband. I wouldn't tell you about um, our sex life. I wouldn't tell you about like a, a, a day that my whole family was like kind of in a big, huge fight with each other and hated each other. Like, you know, I, I there's tons and tons and tons of stuff that's that I reserve um, for my private life. But in a novel, and this is why I think kind of fiction is more honest than nonfiction. In a novel, like if I ever get this thing out, every single thing in that novel is true. It's just um, rearranged. Don't it's not that. true in a literal sense. Like every part of every character in that novel is me. The husband has things about me. The wife has things about me. And it's just pulled apart and and set in different characters and then let them go. It's just like the externalization of uh, a personality and a set of characteristics that are typically at war within a single person. You can like pull them apart and let them go to war on the page. So I, I, you know, and I can have sex scenes in a novel and I can be inside many characters heads in a novel and I can know motive. I can decide motive in a novel. So yeah, I think there is an honesty in fiction that I think that's why fiction exists. I think that's why we tell stories, made up stories is because we want to talk about things that are not polite to talk about. You don't want to pull punches. Yeah. Yes. Well, we're getting ready to take some questions from the viewers, but while I'm looking at them, if you could tell me, I know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was one of your dream guests before all of this happened. What would you most like have been able to ask her or talk to her about? I mean, I think our relationship with Scalia is, is particularly fascinating right now where there are so few. I mean, I, I literally cannot think of a single real friendship between a conservative and a liberal um, in Washington. And they were kind of like famously respectful of one another. And so I would have loved to have heard, you know, like the details, like, what do you guys do? Like you sit at a bar somewhere, you go to dinner, you go lift weights together in the Supreme Court gym. Like how, how do you interact mm -hmm. and, and where? And is it a strictly an intellectual thing? Um, and, you know, is there, is there any point, is there any risk to that friendship? Like, is there like a bridge too far for either of you? Or are you always, are you so admiring of each other's intellect that you're always interested in what he has to say? You know, I was thinking, I was watching um, the uh, 
Amy Barrett um, hearing yesterday and today. And I was thinking, I'm so grateful that this is being televised. I'm so grateful that I have an uninterpreted access to what this woman is saying because the interpretations have become less and less trustworthy over time. And so I'd rather see it for myself. Like, I think I'm gonna turn into like a C-SPAN watcher because I just wanna see what they say. I don't wanna read what someone else thought of what they said. Yeah, although sometimes people are looking for nuance that's not immediately apparent to me until somebody yes. points it out. So I Yes, think, absolutely. I mean, but I don't usually find that when I was reading Twitter, I was like, oh, that's interesting. So that's why she said such and such, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, if you are, have a question for Kelly and you're not on, you have to submit them at theinquirer.com rather than if you're watching on Facebook at the moment or, or on YouTube, you you would have to come to inquirer.com. Um, so I'm being asked, how game is your family for the way you share your life and your writing, especially your girls? How you know, do, do so they feel funny. to really see themselves through your lens? I really think um, being a teenager is like walking around in like a lampshade with mirrors all the way around the inside. Like they, they I just don't think they care about anything I do. Like they, neither of them, they both watched the first episode on PBS. This is a prime time interview show on national television. Like this is far and away the biggest thing that's ever happened to me. They watched Brian Stevenson. They didn't watch Corden. Do this one. Yeah, that's one episode's good. They don't need to like watch the whole thing. I mean, I think that is so funny. They even like James Corden. Like we all love carpool karaoke. Not interested. Like I'd have to make them watch that. It's like one hour of television. So they're definitely not reading what I'm writing. And I just, I just don't even think it exists for them. I don't think they care at all. So the, the question was how, really how mortified were they when you shared that poop story and tell me more? Didn't care. No. 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 Well, that's good. Yeah. Um, so it's all very abstract to them. Like the idea that. Because that when they were little, they used to come to readings with me, and so they would they would see me do it, and they would see the crowd like responding to me, and it was real people, and they were look the people in the audience would look at me and look at them and look at me and look at them, and you could see, but they were so little, and all these nice people would come to readings would like bring them treats, so they'd get you know a little book or a little dolly or so uh, you know some crayons, so it was just all upside as far as they were concerned. And then they became older and less interested. And then now they hardly ever see me do anything. <laughs> well, um, somebody's asking, how did you choose the interviewees for your show? Because they were very different, but very equally interesting. Um, you know, we it, it's so hard. It's like amazingly hard to get people to, especially to agree to a show that hasn't been done yet. So now I think it'll be much easier in the spring. We're gonna try to be back on in March with another set of seven episodes and we're looking for sponsors for that. So if your company would like to associate with us, we'd love to have you. Um, and it will be much easier now because now we can show them these clips. But I mean, we were going in blind and I had done something with Brian Stevenson before. So I had a little cred with him and I'm friends with Jen Garner. So that I had, she was the first person to say yes. And I just called her directly and said, of doing this thing and I need you and will you do it? And she said, of course, oh my God, this is so exciting. Like she's as nice as people think she is. And then James, th this I had this friend and he's seen a lot of people do their thing kind of. And I said, if you could have anyone, like who do you think the best person you've ever seen kind of, you know, best talker you can think of? And he thought of some people and then finally he goes, oh, James Corden, he's unbelievable. He's so smart, he's so thoughtful. He's really funny and quick on his feet. And it was like, okay, great. So that that's how that idea even came to us. But well, I mean, chances, we did ask quite a lot of people. Well, the chances are that none of the people you want are watching this, but just in case, who yeah. would you most like to get the next time? Dave Chappelle. Oh yeah. I love Dave Chappelle. Um, and we, we, we really tried hard this time and we had some, you know, some conversation. So it was, it doesn't feel like it's, absolutely impossible but i'd love dave chappelle i'd love sonia sotomayor now uh, those are probably my top two gets is that possible a son 
I think so. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen uh, other interviews with other justices, sitting justices. Well, I guess so. you wanted you wanted Ruth Bader Ginsburg, so I, I suppose did. that. Who didn't? Yeah. Oh, no. I know. Um, well, let's see. We've been doing this hilarious thing where we plank for 97 seconds. Sorry, 87 seconds, because she was 87 and she's Seven. a big player. And while we plank, Claire reads us Ginsburg quotes. Oh, I love that. It's hysterical. Yeah, 87 seconds is about my limit these days, so. I can't do I always have to like bring my butt up and do like a down dog for a second. And then Claire yeah. or my husband will say, go down, you have to be flat. Yeah, yeah, I'm, well, I, I always think about her planking. She was so small. I, mean, she was, I know she, no I know she, I, I mean, she's, yes, she's 87 years old and she's planking and that's fabulous, but she's only holding up about five pounds. As well. I, know. <laughs> I know, she was a little bird. And there should be degrees of difficulty. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're writing now and how is the you know, trash? I'm writing so much short form stuff. Like I'm writing a thing right now that I hope will be an op-ed um, around election day. Like I'm writing and it's, it's sort of my takeaways on what we always have in common with another person, even people that we have convinced ourselves that we have nothing in common with and maybe even despise. Um, and so it was this thought exercise that I put myself through to like make a monster list of every single thing that we have in common um, with any other person on the planet. And it was really satisfying. And so I'm writing shorter things like that, but I do need to, I do need to deal with this book about my dad and, and decide whether I'm going to do it or not. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to finish it. I'm at, I have 220 pages and there's just something missing and I don't know what it is, but I'll, I'll well, have to pay attention to that soon. I mean, you have written about him extensively in the past. What's different about this book? It's so sad. It's so sad. And I just want to, what Andy Ward, my editor at Random House said is um, that when, you know, when you write about your dad, you're at your absolute best. Like it totally flows. It's, it's lovely to read. It feels so good to see that much love on the page. Um, there's more that you could do here. You could say something about loss rather than just this loss. And so we were trying this one idea and then I tried another idea. And so anyway, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to find that, just kind of that extra layer to put on top of the story that will make it even more useful for people. Yeah, and it's it is so hard to write about something that's still. I mean, I know it's been five years, but it's still very fresh. And yeah, when you lose a parent in so many I ways. I cry every single time I I work on it, every time. Well, that might. It's a terrible segue, but somebody is asking how have you been able to find a writing routine in the pandemic, particularly on days when you find it easier to give. Yeah. It's all horrible. All, all my routine. First of all, I'm not a very routine, routinized person. And I never have been. And I finally accepted it. So if I could share a piece of advice, like whatever, you work how you work. And there are people who get up at the same time every day. And they have their cup of coffee. And they write for five hours. And they don't see another human being. Then they walk for two miles. And then they take their, you know, if you're not that person, you're not that person. And stop being mad at yourself for being who you are. But doesn't that sound great? Incredible. It's so <laughs> Just, incredible. My friend Susanna Meadows, who's a writer, she wrote a great book called The Far Side of Impossible. She is like that. Like she gets up and she takes her boys to school and then she writes and then she picks them up. And she doesn't even know where the time goes. Oh, I just can't believe it. I'm always like, oh, it's 2.30 already. Like, oh my God. So I don't have a routine. I'm accepting that. And my kids say like, when are you getting this stuff done? And I'm like, I don't know. Like it's all kind of fits and starts. It's all very um, irregular. And then there'll be this flurry of activity and then I'll sort of fade out on something. And then, you know, so it, it, I, I don't have, I have a pretty erratic work pattern. Well, besides painting, I mean, you don't, you really don't seem like somebody who was built for this virtual life. You, <laughs> you like to be yeah. in people's faces. And, I do. And, other than getting to spend a bit of extra time with your family, have you found anything good in all of this? I mean, if you're, I, I think of it as like a pandemic bingo card. Mm. We got a dog again. 
we I we went back to bread baking for a while. Thank God we're past that. <laughs> um, I had I had non. I had How funny was that, James Corden last night or Monday right, night? Bread. Right. I mean, I'm not. I'm still yeah, eating. Bread. I'm still eating some, but at least I'm not baking it constantly. Um, did you? Besides painting, any other new hands-on hobbies or something else that you, you no, feel like it's a cliche? It's so funny to say, um, like besides spending time with your family, dot dot dot. Like well, spending time with your family is really significant. Like Georgia, our older daughter went to St. Paul's in New Hampshire for sophomore, junior, senior year of high school. So we gave that kid up for like we gave up six hundred days with that kid, about two hundred days a year. And it never got easier. It never, I never felt more sure about it. it. It always tortured me. And then all of a sudden we got her back and we had it. We had dinner with her every night for six months. And I thought, this is incredible that I would have this time with you. Like I have cried so much about that boarding school decision. And here you are. Like, I can't believe it. So. I, I feel like, um, like I play backgammon every night at five o'clock with my husband. We play through best of three and um, we're like little old people. Like we have our plate of cheese and crackers and our drink and our backgammon. And sometimes we put tennis on, but then we mute it. And <laughs> both of us are like, I feel like my we're turning into our parents. And I'm always like, I know, and I love it. Like I, I could do this, this old people part of being old is lovely. Yeah, I think it's better to do the old people stuff when you're not yet actually old. Yeah. You can enjoy it more. I really um, I really like this part of marriage, I must say. Like I'm 20 years in and um I I feel way like more grateful than I ever have for him and just for the easiness of it and it's just such a gift. It's such a gift to to like your spouse and feel safe and supported and and he's so nice. I mean, he's so nice. Like I have gained like 17 pounds in COVID and he literally has not noticed. Like he okay. said, you look great to me. I said, Edward, none of my clothes fit. Like I, I can't even wear my pajamas. I had to buy new pajamas. And he's like, I didn't even notice. I'm like, God, that is really nice. It is nice. Mm -hmm. Those are keepers. Yeah. Um, Somebody's asking, besides Michael Lewis, any other favorite writers, fiction and nonfiction? My favorite, 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 favorite is Marilyn Robinson. She wrote Gilead, Lila, Home, and just a new one called Jack. She's also written a million uh, really powerful, complex, heady essays that you have to be like perfectly caffeinated to even follow because it's like next level. But I I think Gilead is like the the best novel that's been written in like a hundred years. Like, I think it's so special. It's a letter from a dying uh, minister, preacher man um, to his very young son. So he married this woman, this very poor woman who came into his church and they had a child and he's writing to that child cause he's gonna die and he knows it. And he wants to tell his, that kid what it has been to be his father. And it is so beautiful. It will like, it'll change your heart rate. I don't know exactly what happened. My, can you see me? Cause my screen just went black. Oh yeah, I can see you. Oh good. All right. Yeah. I'm not sure. I can't and see I can you. See questions. Do you want me to ask myself one? Um, I'm not sure what the problem is, um, mm -hmm. but as long as you can see me, we're, we're getting ready to wrap up anyway. Uh, your, um, TV show has one more episode yes. and Jennifer Garner on Monday at nine o'clock on WHYY for local uh, viewers. And your podcast is also going to be on HYY FM. You That's right. On uh, November 21st at four o'clock in the afternoon, that's a Saturday, it will start running. Kelly Corgan wonders the, the podcast radio show and it'll run the, there are 18 episodes lined up. So Saturdays at four o'clock, but not for a month. So if you want to hear it now, which I hope you do, just go to your podcast app and put in Kelly Corrigan Wonders. Yes, and I highly recommend it. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, it's oh, been my pleasure. pleasure having you. Thanks for keeping me off my phone for an hour. Yes, thank you for keeping Well, I've been looking at mine a little bit, but just for, just for the questions I've written down. Yeah.
And right. thank you, Philly. Thank you to the Inquirer. I, 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 my mom reads you every day and you guys have been amazing. And uh, so thanks for doing the hard work of being reporters right now. Well, be sure to thank your mom for reading us every day. <laughs> we can oh, yeah. everybody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Take care. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.